Adobe just launched Lightroom Classic version 15. Let's take a look at what's new for landscape photographers. And the headline feature here is really going to be this new AI-based assisted culling. In the library module, under this early access tab, assisted culling will let you filter your images based on the ones which are best. This is definitely geared towards photos of people in high volume. So think family get-togethers, weddings, things like that. But even landscape photographers will often shoot family events. So I think it's worth noting the features we have here to help sort based on whether the subject's in focus or the eyes are in focus, the eyes are open, whether there are exposure issues. I think it's an interesting way of helping quickly sort a large number of images. For example, I could turn on subject focus as my criteria. Then for view, I want to use selects, meaning the best ones. And then I can change the criteria for the focus here. So right now it's pretty loose towards allowing softer images. But as I crank this up, it'll start to reject images it considers to be less sharp. So it's showing just the sharpest images this way. And underneath the assisted culling tab is the culling scores where you can see how it thinks. So the subject in focus score is 95 here. Whereas if I open up the criteria and then look at, say, this image, it's only a 47. Now, I'm not sure I would give this a low score. It is still a very sharp image, but it's taken on an iPhone and I can see how it might have rated differently than something I shot with my mirrorless camera. So not something you're probably gonna use for a lot of landscape images, but when you're shooting people, this could be a huge time saver and it's definitely worth checking out. So let's turn this off and take a look at the next feature, which is actually my favorite. If we go to the develop module, under the color mixer tab here, you have point color. So normally you'd look at the color mixer as kind of your default view. Go to point color. And this tool has been around for a while, but what's new is the new variant slider. And this is really cool. When you have colors in your image, like this big block of green here, and you want to increase color separation, you can increase the variance. You could do things like help make the fall color in these foreground bushes really stand out. Or you could go in the opposite direction and make things more unified so there's less color separation. So either is possible, and I think this can be a truly powerful tool. So let's give it a try. I'm gonna go click for the point color sampler. Let's go sample off some of the mid-ground color here. And so now it's doing everything relative to that color. And what I wanna do is jump down to the variant slider. And if I just push this to the right, watch what happens. It increased the separation of colors near this one. So the reds and yellows, the greens, are all pretty close to this, and it created more difference in color, more color contrast by pushing to the right. I went from before to after, and that is just amazing for shots like this. I mean, now I can really see the separation of the mid-ground from the distant hills. The foreground color here really pops, especially against that river. I think that just looks awesome like this. Now, let's say we wanna give a little more separation to the mid-ground. Well, I could work on that as well. What I'm looking at here is the global color mixer, but we can do this locally as well. So if we go up to our masking section, let's go create a new mask. We'll do a radial gradient and put it over the midground like so. Just kind of rotate this into position, maybe like that. And it has its own point color. So I just go back and sample once again, maybe around here. And I can play with the variance. I can add more separation to the midground, gives a little more contrast from before to after. Or if I want to make it more of a full color, I can also do a hue shift with it and kind of drive those colors depending on what I want to do. I don't know that I want to do a lot of that. I could also do less variance if we went the opposite direction. You see it gets kind of unified. So that really would kind of separate that and then you know pull this back. So if my goal was to really put emphasis in the foreground, I can make the midground and the background blend together. That's not what I want to do, but you can see how the variance can go in either direction to have less separation or to have more separation. And I think in this case, more separation is probably the way to go. Let's see how we did there. Something like that is too much of a hue shift. Bring that back a bit. I went the wrong direction here. Let's go bring it to less of a hue shift. And I'm hitting a little bit more of the hill than I want. Let's tighten this up a little bit like so and try that. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. So just overall backing out of that, we went from this original shot here, which I liked, to this where there's just a lot more of the color that drew me to this scene. That to me is a, a study in color and we created this great separation. And of course, in another scene, maybe color is just a distraction. Maybe you don't want this color, you could unify it. Let's try and create a virtual copy. And we'll go and just make a little tweak here. If we go to our global color mixer here, we've already sampled it. Let's just bring the variance down 
kind of unify things. So if you wanted to have less color separation, maybe drive the saturation or the shift towards the greens here and the hues. Now we've got that. So whatever direction you want to take it, do you want to create more color? Absolutely. And that's what I would do here. You want to create less color? You can do that. It just depends on what the image needs. Let's take a look at another example. On this next image of a flower here, let's say I want to create a separation between this flower and the background. Well, I can go and sample globally. Now, if I go and sample from the reds up top, what we'll find is I create more separation in the flower itself. It's creating more separation from the color in the middle of the flower to the edges. I don't think that's terribly attractive. It didn't really do what I wanted to do. So I created variance around the wrong color. I don't want to do it around the reds. Let's undo that. And it said, let's resample again. So grab the color sampler. And in this time, go do it around some of the yellows in the flower instead. Now let's push up the variance. And you can see that it's driving more red in the flower and making the background more green. Now that's going too far. I need to pull that back quite a bit to something closer to say 30. But you can see how that now makes a nice adjustment in the color of the image. And the key is picking the right sample point to make sure you separate the thing you're working with relative to what you want to alter. I would have naturally instinctively grabbed the red to separate that, but actually separating based on the yellow was a better choice. So do a little bit of experimenting with this tool, playing with the variance, what you sample on, and the hue shift. All three of those, I think, play together in interesting ways, and it takes a little time to get the most out of this tool, but it's highly worth spending some time with it. Then next up on the left here, you have these presets tab you can open up. And under that, you have this adaptive landscape section, something you may not have seen before. You can hover over these and get a preview of the direction it'll take your image to try different looks for landscape. And some of them can be kind of interesting. I think, you know, some of them can be, in this case, kind of terrible. But imagine if we go back to our fall scene here, what do we get if we hover? You see it says detecting at the bottom, give it a second to catch up and then you know play with the color it's way too much here but you know i think for the right image it could be interesting i haven't yet found an image where i really wanted to use this and you definitely would want to make adjustments to your editing after you use it so it's not a tool that i expect to use often but it is something to be aware of it could be very interesting for the right image next up let's take a look here i've got an image where i would like to remove a dust spot it's not obvious right now but if i go to the remove tool what we'll find is that the distraction removal section here, if you open that up and open up dust, we now have this apply feature for an AI based dust removal. This is something which was in tech preview for Adobe Camera Raw and I demonstrated it depth before. Now it's a core part of Lightroom, which is awesome. In this image, if I click on visualize spots, notice up top here, there is a dust spot right here. So let's turn off the visualization and there's a dust spot here. It may not be super obvious to you right away, but you know, I can clearly see there's a dust spot there. When I turn on apply for the AI base dust removal, it cleans that up. Just take a look from, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to close that. Going back from before to after, how it just removes that dust spot. So I think this is a fantastic little tool when you're shooting out in the field at smaller apertures like F16, you get a lot of dust spots and this tool just does an awesome job of removing them. So another highly welcome addition to Lightroom. Next up on this is for those of you working with the HDR capabilities of Lightroom, something I teach quite a bit. In the previous version of Lightroom, HDR range was a drop down where you could choose one, two, three, four, or full, meaning eight stops as your upper limit for HDR. This is now a slider where you can go from one stop to eight stops of limitation. You see how the image has changed there? Let's go back here. The default you're going to see now on a new image when you first open up HDR is going to be 2.3 stops of headroom. For those of you working on a uh, modern iPad or Apple MacBook Pro, you are well under the capabilities of your display, which oftentimes are going to be up to four stops. And you see just by changing that limit from before to after, it didn't make the image dramatically better. You might think by lifting the maximum value in the image, and that's what this is, is the maximum value I can take my histogram for HDR, you would think it would make the image feel brighter. It doesn't really do that here. It just brings through the color. And so the reason I'm showing this limit slider is that I think it's something that most people would have ignored in the past. And now that it's set to a lower value, it's going to affect quite a few of you. So if we just step back for a second, here's the default 2.3. If I just open the image, start editing in HDR, and I don't play with this slider, 
I am going to very quickly clip the blues in this image here. And to get them back, I need to address the fact that my histogram is being artificially limited by this slider and just bring it up to something like four. So when you do this, you're just allowing a brighter value and that's perfectly fine and safe to do. When you export these images as a gain map, it will just adapt to any display. I believe the default should just stay at four. If you don't use the full range, it doesn't matter. The image will be encoded with whatever is necessary, but limiting it to less than four can clip your image. The benefit here is probably for folks who would overdo HDR when it's at a lower limit, you're gonna be more inclined to grab things like the highlight slider and maybe try and recover the color that way. It's the wrong edit for this image, but it would tend to push you towards using less HDR and not overdoing it. So I think from sort of a nudging you in the direction of being more conservative with HDR, perhaps that's helpful. But for creatives who've really mastered HDR, you're definitely gonna to want to allow the full four stops when appropriate and just be aware of this slider. Let's look at a couple of other quick examples here. If I go look at this fire image, it's now set to the default 2.3 and it looks great. What you're not seeing here is there's actually a loss of data. And the key is if we look at the histogram here, you see the spike on the right hand side, it's blocking up here because of that limit. When I go and raise the HDR limit up towards four, that data spreads out. So you can see as I move left, everything kind of you know, creates a big spike and towards the right, it opens up. So even just at like three and a half or so, I'm allowing the data to show where it should. Watch the image here. If I go back to where I was at 2.3, it's clipped, whereas without it, the fire shows more true. So it just enhances the image and you could very easily not realize you're clipping your data. And one last example on that front, here's another image where you don't even realize it, but it's clipping the images. As I hover here, you can see that the readout was showing values of 2.3, 2.3, 2.3. So all three values are clipped to 2.3 stops into the HDR range white. So it's losing color, it's losing the difference that should be here in the sky because of this new default limit at 2.3. And you cannot change the default. I really wish that Adobe would give us an ability to set a preference saying, hey, let me use four, I know what I'm doing. You can always change it yourself, but as it stands now, you have to change it on every image where you need more. Let's go and bring this up to the full four or something like it to unleash the capability here. And you see how we now have that color from before where it's blocked up to after it shows through. So you can see this image doesn't look too bright. It's not blinding. None of these examples are ones where that extra headroom was a negative in terms of being too bright to view on Instagram or services like that. It just showed a much better looking image that quite frankly, most people would view as being a similar brightness as before. In fact, I think on the example here, when it was clipped, you might actually believe that the clipped version, which is definitely darker, you might believe this is brighter because of the whites, your eyes may trick you to think it's brighter versus when you allow the brighter image, it actually kind of looks darker. So kind of a counterintuitive thing here, just something to be aware of. I can't think of a good reason to artificially limit this unless you just want to be careful not to let a few pixels go above the limit. Like if the top of this building was shooting up to say like five stops or something brighter than you need, it's okay to clip it and can be helpful. But for most people, the nuances of how this works is going to probably confuse people. And you just want to be aware that you may need to lift this up towards four to get the most out of your images. I would not go beyond four unless you really know what you're doing something like 5.6 or 6.6 .6 stops is the most I would ever do for any image on any display. You should not be going up to the full max here. It's unlikely it's gonna show up in your image, but in cases where this might be a factor, it could cause some unwanted technical issues. And then lastly, I'm gonna hit command comma to go into the preferences for Lightroom. And if you go to the external editing section, you'll see we have a new ability to determine how our images are exported over to software like Photoshop, whether it's SDR or HDR. So in the past, we just had one set of settings for color space, bit depth, resolution, and compression. Now we can set them for SDR images differently than for HDR images. Now, most of you are probably gonna still use the same compression settings, no matter what you're doing. You always wanna use, you know, 16 bits for SDR, probably not eight, and HDR would have automatically gone up to 32 anyway. For resolution, you'd set it wherever you like for your work, like you know, 300 DPI. For HDR, it doesn't really matter because it's unprinted resolution has really no impact. 
So most of these settings don't need to be differentiated between SCR and HDR, but the one where it's going to have some impact for some of you is going to be the color space. For HDR work, I would leave it in Rec 2020 to keep the full color. And then when you do your final export, then you would choose something smaller like P3 or sRGB. So I would definitely set this to Rec 2020 for HDR. For SDR, I think Rec 2020 is actually a great choice, but many of you may prefer to work with Adobe RGB or ProPhoto RGB because that's what you've done historically. And technically ProPhoto RGB has a little bit more color in the cyan kind of green range than you can get out of Rec 2020. I don't think it's practically all that important and I would prefer Rec 2020 generally speaking, but you might prefer ProPhoto and now you have that choice, which is not a choice when you're working with HDR. And while we're in here, I'm gonna show you a couple other settings that are not new, but just something a lot of people miss for HDR. If we go to the preset section, you wanna enable HDR editing by default for HDR photos, meaning that when you open up an HDR edited photo or a RAW file, it will automatically turn on the HDR mode for you. It's not gonna change it for images already in your catalog, but when you import them, it will import them with HDR on for images which would benefit from HDR. And then under performance, you want to enable HDR in library. When you do this, you'll be able to see an HDR version of your image when you're viewing it in the large version inside the library. Be sure to click the link below to see the written version of this tutorial to learn more about the other updates in Photoshop as well. And now click to this next video to learn more about HDR in Lightroom.